Praise the Lord, folks. It is 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening. That means it's time, of course, for our midweek Bible study. And as always, we greet you this afternoon in none other than the wonderful saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're happy to have you with us today. I hope that by the end of this study, you will uh, walk away a little bit uh, more enlightened, encouraged, inspired, uplifted. Uh, if you are one who has struggled with your uh, identity as a member of the LGBT community and, uh, and uh, your faith in God, then uh, hopefully by the end of this, uh, you will have a very different uh, understanding and you'll be able to walk with the Lord as you ought to be able to walk with the Lord. Amen. So we want to start this afternoon. Don't mind me, my dogs are a little bit rambunctious. I threw them a little bit of food here a minute ago. Now I'm trying to get them to calm down. Um, we want to start this evening with a word of prayer. So if you'll bow your heads with me, Master, we love you today, Lord, and we thank you, God, for this opportunity to come together as the people of God to explore your sacred word. We ask God tonight that the anointing, the presence, and power of the Holy Ghost would rest mightily upon us. Help us, Lord to effectively communicate the truths of your word that are necessary to help people who for too long have walked in unnecessary condemnation and guilt, to help them find victory and peace, and to renew the joy of your salvation in their lives. Master, today touch both my lips as well as the ear of every hearer. Allow our hearts today to be cultivated and prepared to receive the engrafted Word of God. We ask it all and none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I want to talk to us tonight. There are two. I'm going to try to do this real quick so that uh, I can get two different uh, lines of thought in. First of all, I want to talk for a little bit on the concept of uh, the LGBT person and grace. All I heard growing up as a kid was that salvation was attained through faith in Jesus Christ. One must believe that the Lord died on the cross of Calvary and rose again on the third day, if they are to be saved from sin. Now apparently, I've learned since then, this truth applies to everyone with the exception of the homosexual. In spite of the fact that many LGBT people embrace uh, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, they remain lost, uh, or so we're told by many, because of the fact that they are gay or lesbian, bisexual, transgender. If only they were, or if only they had been born heterosexual, then they could have easily been saved. Foolishness, folks. This is foolishness. I've believed this wonderful message since I was a child, and my being gay has not changed that fact one iota. The same stands true for millions of LGBT people around the world. I've seen this absurd contradiction all my life. I remember as a young man, uh, the Lord called me to preach when I was eight, and I remember that even as a young person, I contemplated this contradiction. And I had a problem with the notion 
that God's simple plan of salvation applied to some, but not to others. The fundamental problem with this selective salvation teaching is that it assumes that one's sexual orientation is enough an issue to prevent them access to God's love and grace. It also assumes that believers are somehow made perfect upon conversion, and we become something extra human after we have been converted from unbelief to faith. Of course, we know this notion is erroneous, <laughs> if not flat-out idiotic. Faith in Christ does not make one perfect, but it does put us on the roll so that one day we might be perfected. It really breaks my heart to see LGBT people roped into the false message that grace does not apply to them quote-unquote, as long as they remain in their sinful lifestyle. The Lord Jesus Christ himself clearly taught, as we've been discussing in recent weeks, that divorce was a man-made device that had no part in God's original plan for humanity from the very beginning. Yet, what churches today tell divorced people that they cannot be saved as long as they have been divorced. No church teaches that. Everyone, and I do mean everyone, that breathes God's free air and lives on planet Earth is subject to sin. That is the reality, not only uh, of the world in which we live, but that is what the Word of God teaches us. The Apostle John, I frequently reference this, reference this. The Apostle John said, if we say that we have no sin, then we make God a liar, and the truth is not in us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul said this was not a reference to the unbelieving world. This was a reference to believers, the church. Who in the world that is a non-believer is even making any effort to glorify God in their living? Nobody. So when he said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then Paul is clearly speaking of the believing world, the church, not the unbelieving world. Okay, so as long as we have breath in our body and we're subject to Earth's gravity, we are also under the influence of sin. Everyone alive remains in sin. What we become in reality, according to the Word of God, is immune to the penalties and jurisdiction of sin through faith in Jesus Christ. So it's not that we're not subject to sin itself. We are no longer subject to its jurisdiction and therefore its penalties because Jesus Christ has assumed the penalty on our behalf. Okay, he didn't just... He didn't just pay for your sin up till the day you were converted, my friend. That's idiotic. The Word of God said if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right there, that tells you plainly that believers must surely sin. But the pathway to 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 clearing our record and wiping it clean, God has also created. And it's the simplest path in the world. He said if we confess our sins, if we approach God honestly. This is why I say one of the things about a progressive ministry, affirming ministry, since I've been engaged in it, and since I've been doing this for the last 30 years, 
One of the things about it that I really love, for the first time in my life, I really serve God honestly. I'm not lying to myself, and I'm not lying to God. I'm not trying to justify myself. I'm not trying to um, suggest that something I've done or do that <laughs> perhaps I shouldn't, uh, you know, is somehow okay. Let me tell you, I grew up in fundamentalism, honey. People sit around all day and all night talking about stuff, and if they're called on it or if they somehow or another a scripture's brought out that kind of checks them in some of their ill conduct, you're going to hear all kinds of justifications. You're going to hear all kinds of reasons why. Well, but, but it's okay that I do this. It's okay that I sit in judgment of my neighbor. It's okay that I condemn people that I don't agree with. It's okay that I act hateful and malicious to people because I don't approve of their so-called lifestyle. No, it's not okay. Nowhere in the Word of God are you going to find justification for that kind of conduct and that kind of behavior. Oh, but in the fundamentalist world, honey, you'll hear all kinds of arguments that'll justify that type of behavior. When I came into affirming ministry, you know, I, I finally understood what David, the psalmist and king, meant in the Psalms when he says to the Lord, my sin I have not hid from thee. He said, Lord, I'm not hiding behind a rock somewhere. I'm not acting like Adam and Eve in the garden and holding uh, leaves over my private parts so I can conceal the fact that I now have knowledge I really shouldn't have because I did something I really shouldn't have done. No. When I come before the Lord now, I come before God and I say, Lord, I'm a sinner saved by grace. If it wasn't for your grace, there is no, there is no hope in heaven that I could ever be saved. There isn't. Because if I were straight as an arrow tomorrow, there are so many other things in my life that contradict the law of Moses that uh, to offend at one is to offend at all. So... You know, and this is the problem. We have people who keep wanting to dip into the law of Moses, and yet foolish people that they are, I'm trying to be nice tonight, foolish people that they are, they don't even understand the law. They don't understand how the law worked. They don't understand how the law was applied. They don't understand nothing about the law. And for them to dip in it and pick out one thing that they can hold against you, well, you contradict the law in this one area. There's one Jewish rabbi, famous, well-known Jewish rabbi that I've studied. And uh, I found his works to be, his writings to be very interesting. And he was saying, he said, I talked to Pat Robertson. He was friends. He knew Pat Robertson. And he said, I've talked to Pat Robertson, and I asked him, why are you evangelicals so hung up on the issue of homosexuality? And, of course, Pat Robertson gave him this song at dance. Oh, it's the destruction of our civilization. You know, the whole world is going to collapse because of it. And this Jewish rabbi who was or I should say, is the, the Jewish equivalent to a Pat Robertson, you know, very, very renowned in the Jewish world. He said, no, it isn't. You know, he said, uh, you people have taken scriptures from our texts. <laughs> I know the original language, okay? I was bar mitzvah. I had to learn Hebrew and I can read the original text in the original tongue, and I know exactly what they say, and they don't say what you say they say. 
and you've taken this issue and you've tortured it and you've tormented it and you've twisted it and perverted it until you've made LGBT people the enemy. Somehow they're wicked, they're evil, you know, they're the most horrible people. And this rabbi said, nowhere does God ever say that. In the Hebrew text, nowhere does God say that. But that is the work of carnal men. They want to justify themselves in their own sin because they're honest enough to look and realize <laughs> that they've got all kinds of sin in their own lives. They won't admit to it and they won't confess it, certainly. But they know, in fact, that is the case. And the only way to make themselves look far better is to make somebody else look far worse. So if I make these people over here dogs and, you know, garbage and evil and wicked and blah, 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 blah then that makes my little transgression look like nothing. Okay, so really it is a smoke and mirror show is what it is. It's a distraction. And so anyway, talking about grace as it applies to the LGBT believer, we're no longer under the penalty of sin. We're no longer under the jurisdiction of sin. It is not that we no longer live with sin, but like a foreign diplomat in a host country, we are not subject to the laws of that country, but rather the laws of our own country. And I'm going to tell you, this is the, the biggest mistake that is made in the Christian world. It's very, 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 very simple. The biggest mistake made in Christianity is this. As a believer, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. And Paul, read it in context, was talking when he said in the flesh, he was referring to the law of Moses, because he was saying the law relied upon the acts of the flesh and relied upon what we were capable of doing in the flesh. He said, who walked not after the flesh. He wouldn't talk about living, quote unquote, lustfully and carnally. No, he was talking about living after the mandate of the law, trying to satisfy God by reason of our own conduct and our own behavior, okay? He said, but walk after the Spirit. So when we walk after the leading of the Spirit, then we are relying upon the grace of God by faith in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And we still sin, we still flub up, we still goof up. If our conscience pricks us and alerts us, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to really upset some, uh, especially Pentecostal people. If ever there's been a word that has been misused in theological circles, it is the word conviction. According to the Apostle Paul, there's no such thing as the Holy Ghost convicting. The Word of God says that the Spirit of the Lord convinces. There's a world of difference between convincing somebody of something and convicting them of something. But Paul said that conviction comes from our own conscience. So when we really deep down know good and well the right thing to do and we do the wrong thing, our own conscience will convict us, okay? And it is not God. And just because somebody can get up in a pulpit, <coughs> I used to be able to get up in the pulpit and preach, preach people practically into tears for chewing gum. Think I'm joking? I'm not joking. I'm serious as a heart attack. 
I used to preach chewing gum was the same as smoking cigarettes. It offers you no nutritional value. It has nothing to do with nutrition. It's all about satisfying the desire of your flesh, you know, in taste and flavor. At least if you eat a cookie, you know, you get some calories and you get some nutrition from it. Uh, energy, what have you. But gum, you get nothing. So how is gum different than chewing tobacco? How is gum different than smoking a cigarette? And back in the day, boy, I could preach a message on chewing gum and have you feel so bad about chewing gum that you'll swear off dentine for the rest of your life. You'll think Wrigley's is uh, born of Satan, that that company come right out of hell to tempt you. You follow what I'm trying to get at today? In other words, people think because I've been to church and I got to feeling bad when the preacher was preaching this or that, that was the Spirit of God convicting me. No, no, no. No. If, if anything, it was your own conscience, number one. And then number two, anybody can be made to feel bad about virtually anything. When I was a kid growing up, I, I talk about this frequently. I do it on purpose. I Believe me, I don't like doing it. I, if, if I could get around ever talking about these things, I'd be a happy camper. But I talk about them because there are so many people in our world who think that preachers, you know, all grew up in ivory towers and we all had praying moms and, you know, dancing in the aisle, preacher daddies, and everything was perfect in our lives. And I like people to understand where I'm coming from in my background and what I came up through. Because I understand in today's world there are a lot of people who understand where I come from because they've been down similar roads, if not the same, but maybe, you know, very similar in certain ways. Um, I grew up with a father who was uh, narcissistic to a point that you can't even believe. <sighs> Every Everything you ever did in your life, he didn't like, he hated, he reacted to every, everything as if the world just came to an end because you did this, you know, whatever it may be. He could make his kids feel like poop. Because they left a light switch on in the bathroom. So don't tell me, don't tell me about preachers making people feel bad about stuff. That there must be something to what they're preaching. No. What my father was acting the, the idiot over was stupidity. There was no reason in the universe for him to get that carried away and that goofy over leaving a light switch on in the bathroom, okay? But he could take that and he would rail you and belittle you and just tear into you. And he would do it for hours. I mean, he'd be griping about it for hours to come. Over nothing. Over something as, similar, as simple as, hey, you know how I do it? I turn off the light switch and say, hey... Don't forget to turn off the light when you leave the bathroom. You know what I'm saying? That's all you have to do. But everything with him. And I've seen this kind of conduct, having grown up in that environment. I'm not oblivious to this. I've seen it in preachers on television. I've seen it in preachers in pulpits. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, yeah, I see what you're up to. I see what you're doing. You're taking something that amounts to nothing and you are just tearing into people and lighting into people and you're going to make sure they feel horrible about it and terrible about it because a lot of people have come to the place that they go to church to be abused because they think that's what you're supposed to go to church to experience. One of the things that 
has made our ministry very difficult for many years uh, is the fact that we have a very different approach. I, I guess you might say a different style. Now, I preach like a house on fire, and I mean every word I preach, and I preach every word I preach like I mean it. And I don't apologize for that. I'm not up there to give a talk. I'm not up there. That's not preaching. The whole concept of preaching the Word of God is that you're supposed to deliver it in such a manner that you're convincing, so to speak, okay? Now, some people can take that and abuse it. They can convince you that chewing gum is going to put you in hell, okay? But then there are others, I'd like to believe, like us, who use that to convince you of right thinking and right view, you know what I'm saying, and approaching things from a right perspective. And there are times when, folks, I've had people tell me point blank out, had a lady one time, she and her partner came to Connecticut to sing for us in our church up there, an affirming work in New Haven. She said, well, I was born and raised Catholic. She said, and her partner was born and raised Apostolic Pentecostal. So her partner was fine with me right off the starting line. But this lady said, honestly, when I first heard you preach, you about scared me to death. She said, up there yelling and hollering and, you know, very passionate in your... She said, but I got to tell you, she said, the more I listen the more I like it, she said, because there's something about when you preach, it's not like when the priest gets up and reads a homily. So when you preach, she said, there's something about it that your tone and, and your expression and the way you say certain things, she said, boy, I mean to tell you, it'll stop you dead in your tracks and really make you stop for a minute and think about that. She said, and if you'd have said those exact same words, but just said them, you know, monotone, she said, it had gone like water off a duck's back. She said, but there's something about, you know, just kind of put, you know, put, putting it right in front of your face. She said, that rather makes you stop and think, whoa, yeah, you know what? Yeah, that makes sense, you know? And anybody who's ever studied speech and public speaking, if you've ever taken that in college and stuff, then you understand that they, there, there are certain things um, in public speaking that they teach you. You know, don't speak in a monotone. Don't speak at one consistent level, at one consistent volume, at one consistent pitch. Because if you do that, you literally are going to lose your audience after about three minutes. And I never studied public speaking. I never studied uh, uh, any of that. God called me to preach when I was eight. I started preaching uh, as an adult when I was 16. I started preaching to, you know, congregations and churches when I was 16. I started pastoring at 19. I never did study public speaking. I never went to Bible college. I never studied these things. I just preached the way I felt, you know, it's the way... You know, we, we love when uh, people of color get up and sing, and they riff, you know, they go all over the place. And, ah, 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 you know, I always tease Tommy about, you know, certain uh, famous characters, and I say, she don't sing, she screams, you know, and, and got to go all over the place, you know. I love that. I was, I'm a huge fan when it comes to gospel music, I'm a huge fan of old school black gospel. I'll tell you what. I love me some Mahalia Jackson. I love me Matty Moss Clark. I love me uh, some of the old timers, you know, Ethel Waters and different ones. Uh, and I love when people sing it the way they feel it. Well, the same thing is true with preaching uh, or even just public speaking. It's important that your voice reflect your feelings on the subject. If you're passionate about it, if you feel strongly about it, then 
your audience ought to be able to detect that by your pitch and by your uh, tempo and by your volume and you know what have you. Um, uh, so anyway, um, kind of lost track there for a second. Got to put my glasses back on. I can't even see where I'm at. Okay, so anyway, we were talking about the fact that like a diplomat, we're in it, we're in a country, we're no longer subject to its laws. God has made a path for us to wipe any transgression off the map. Here's, here's, here's the truth I started talking about earlier before I went off on some kind of tangent. Sorry about that, folks. The evangelical and fundamentalist world has made every transgression a test of your salvation. In other words, everything you do wrong, you're you're missing. You're you're gonna miss it. You're gonna go to hell, you're gonna wind up at Armageddon, you're gonna get crushed and squashed by God. Something's gonna happen. Something terrible and awful is gonna happen. Uh, you know, the Jehovah's they don't believe in hell, but they'll scare the bejesus out of you with Armageddon. There are hundreds of young people annually who commit suicide from the Jehovah's Witness movement. Oh, they don't preach hell, and boy, they'll laugh at you for believing in hell. But they use Armageddon to do the exact same thing. Exact same thing. To scare the life out of people. So we're convinced that every little transgression, we're going to miss heaven. And that is a falsehood, because that does not account for grace. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there is a transgression that we have not confessed, honey, you're not going to miss heaven over it. But you are going to answer to God in the judgment for it. And the Word of God said that every man, every man, boy, every woman, girl, every child, every human being is going to stand before God at the white judgment throne and they're going to answer for deeds done in the flesh. That is what the Word of God teaches. Believers, by reason of their faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, are going to inherit eternal life. Period. But the Lord said, Lay up your treasures in heaven where dust and moth doth not corrupt and thieves do not come in to steal. The problem is, there are going to be some people in heaven that are going to need a mansion the size of Walmart to hold all their awards and rewards from God for things they did. And then there's going to be some people in heaven who could live in a shoebox because they ain't got nothing up there. They haven't done one thing in there. They've lived selfishly. They've lived self-centeredly. They couldn't care less about doing nothing for nobody. No kind of way. They have not striven and uh, they have not tried to live their life according to the mandate of God's Word and to live as the Lord taught us to live, which is to love our neighbors we love ourselves and do unto others as we would have others do to us. And there are many people who aren't going to have done that. They want to put in the effort to do that. And, sweetie, they'll be lucky if they get some little shoebox in the corner of glory somewhere. But they'll be in glory. 
So there's a judgment for believers, and we are weighed in the balances when we stand before God in the judgment. And honestly, I hate to say it, because I know, sure as I'm alive, I, I know I'm so far from perfect, I can't even see perfect from where I live. I'm terrified of the judgment, not because I feel like God is going to bar me from heaven. No, 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 I'm not worried about that. But in front of the world, I'm going to have to answer for, for everything I've done that I haven't taken care of while I'm here. God gives us the opportunity in this life to address every misdeed, every misspoken word, every act that is outside of the parameters of Christian conduct. God has given us the means whereby to address these things and to settle them on earth. And the word of God said, Jesus said, whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And this, this concept is what he was talking about. He was saying, if you settle a matter while you're alive, if you ask God for forgiveness, if you've done somebody wrong and you realize, Lord, man, I really did that person wrong. I really mistreated them. I really, God forgive me. You know what I'm saying? And that's all it takes if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> so we can either settle the matter here and have it not face us in the judgment, or if it goes unsettled, we will face it in the judgment. But that is not to say it is going to be a heaven or hell. No, because if it becomes, if every little mistake we make becomes the possibility of missing heaven, what on earth is grace? There is no grace in fundamentalist Christianity. There is no grace in evangelical Christianity. But we need to simply understand there is the concept of judgment, listen, and reward for the believer, and there is the concept of judgment and punishment for the unbeliever. And I, I'm not going to go into it tonight, but I will tell you this, I believe based on the totality of the teaching of God's Word, again, I constantly am saying this, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You can't just take one little passage and, and try to act like it says everything there is to say. No, it has to mesh, it somehow has to fit in with the totality of the whole. And if you look at the totality of the whole of Scripture, I do not for one second believe that eternity for the lost is going to be the same for every single individual. You're not going to tell me, according to the Word of God, that Adolf Hitler is going to be sitting there burning in fire and brimstone right alongside of somebody who lived a good life and was a decent person and what have you, but they rejected the gospel. Again, this is an invention of evangelicalism. This is an invention of fundamentalism. They'll stand there and preach hellfire and brimstone. You know, oh, everybody's going to burn in hell. Everybody, no, not everybody's going to burn in hell. You know how I know? I'll tell you how I know. Because the Lord used a number of different parables referencing the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And he would talk about those who were cast aside or who were cast out. And in one place he said, they're cast into outer darkness. In another place he said, they're cast out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. In another place he talks about fire. Well, fire and weeping and gnashing of teeth and, uh, and a place of darkness, that, those don't all necessarily imply the same identical place. 
I also know, according to the teaching of God's Word, that Abraham's bosom was a place in the Old Testament where the Old Testament saints who were waiting for Messiah would go, and they waited for Messiah to come. And that was actually a compartment in hell. It was part of Hades. And yet, listen to this now, it is called a garden. It was literally referred to as paradise, but it was hell. Oh, I'm, I'm getting a whole bunch of people mad at me now, because bless God, you can't dare go against tradition. You can't go dare think anything different than what we've been saying for all these years now, because we're right and you're wrong. I don't know, but that in eternity there won't be some people who are going to occupy that portion of hell that was once called Abraham's bosom. I don't know that they're not. I do know this. I do know that according to the Word of God, hell is an island. You say it's an island? Yep. Yeah. Because the Bible said in the book of Revelation that God casts hell into the lake of fire. Hell is not the lake of fire. No, it can't be the lake of fire because God throws hell into the lake of fire. So what happens is the lake of fire becomes a barrier. It becomes a moat, as it were. And it's not a moat of water that you can swim across. It's a moat of flames and fire. I don't care if I were living in Club Med. If I looked out my window and saw a lake of fire and I had no ability for eternity to leave that place, I was confined to that place. I don't care how beautiful it could be. I don't care how lovely it might be. I'm confined there. I cannot get out. I will never know what it is to live in the presence of God for eternity. I will never know what it is to enjoy the fellowship of my family and my friends. The Word of God said that after the resurrection we shall be known even as also we were known. There are so many things that the unbeliever is going to miss out. And I'm not saying, don't misunderstand me, I'm not standing here saying for a certainty some people are going to live in a, a garden, you know, in, as part of hell. I don't know. That's the point. There's nothing wrong, folks, with as a Christian every once in a while saying, I don't know. Some people seem to think, bless God, oh no, the Bible provides every answer. No, it doesn't. There's any number of things the Bible doesn't talk about. And you look like an idiot when you try to extrapolate uh, an answer to a question and you're twisting and perverting all kinds of scriptures, you know, in order to come up with your answer because there is no clear and apparent answer in the Word of God. All right, so... Uh, Grace has made a way for us to experience eternal life. Grace has provided a way for us to stand before God righteous, even though we still live under the influence of sin. But although we're under its influence, we are not under its penalty. We are not under its jurisdiction. Now, in Romans chapter, let the old man put his glasses on. In Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, the Apostle Paul writes, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, he said, if I do the things I really don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. 
Now then, it is no more I that do it. Listen, this is Paul writing in the New Testament to the church at Rome. Christians read right past this. They explain it away. They have a thousand ways to explain this way. Listen to what Paul said. He said, now then, it is no more I that do it. He said, I'm doing things I don't want to do, and I'm not doing the things that I do want to do. He said, but when I do this, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. How hard is it to understand that? I remember one time having a conversation with my grandmother. She hated one gospel song. I love the song. I sing it when my allergies aren't driving me up the wall. It says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. My grandmother hated that song. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. Glory to God. If we're a Christian, we don't sin anymore. No, we sure don't. In the eyes of God. If you're a believer, you don't sin anymore in the eyes of God. Just like I've used the analogy over the years. Just like kids, you, 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 sometimes we see a kid and that kid's acting up. And man, we're looking at that child and we're thinking, I'll tell you what, kid. Oh, if, if you were mine, I'd be smacking that behind of yours and making you act right and you wouldn't be carrying on like that if you were my kid. And you're watching mom or dad standing there. Oh, Billy, now calm down. And they're carrying on. And mom and dad are just being as patient as saints. And they're just trying to talk the kid down. And you and I are looking at them like, Ooh, I'd like to take a board to that backside. But somehow or another, mom and dad are able to have patience. They're able to address that child so much differently than, than we would if given the opportunity. Why? It's easy. They're mom and dad. It's that easy. Their relationship to that child is everything. I've got news for you. As a child of God, your relationship to God is everything. He sees you differently. He An unbeliever can do the same thing you're doing, and the Lord would be entirely displeased and very unhappy and very upset. You do it, his response is different. He's more patient. He's more loving. He's more careful. Why? Because you're his kid. This is why. When you get to glory, you're going to have to answer. Daddy's going to call you up and say, okay now, <laughs> you did this, you said that, you know. You never bothered to apologize to anybody. You never, you never bothered to talk to anybody about it. You never bothered to go to the person you hurt, you, you know. And you're going to have to answer for those things. But there is therefore now no condemnation. How hard is that to understand? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. How are we in Christ Jesus? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How are you in Christ Jesus? You're baptized into Christ Jesus. That's what the ordinance of baptism in Jesus' name does makes you part of the body of Christ. And as part of the body of Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ becomes our covering. So now as a believer, all God sees is the good parts. All God sees is the good stuff. Now unfortunately, between earth and heaven, we've got to go through a transformation. This mortal must put on immortality. This 
uh, destructible must put on in destruction, and this corruptible must put on in corruption. Well, between earth and heaven, that means the walnut has the walnut has to be cracked open. When the walnuts cracked open, guess what happens? All that stuff that was covered is now exposed. It's out in the open. Uh oh. Now we got an answer for it. But thank God our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ provided us with access to eternity guaranteed. Not, you know, uh, the gospel, my friend, is not an opportunity to be saved based on whether or not you can live up to some certain standard of perfection or not. No, that's, that's not what the gospel does. No. He puts your name according to the word of God in the Lamb's book of life. And at the judgment, the word of God tells us, he looks through the book, if he sees your name, you're getting in. But again, I can't repeat enough, you will answer for deeds done in the flesh. So obviously, it behooves us to try, number one, try not to do a whole bunch of stupid things that we might have to one day answer for. And number two, if we happen to sin, if we sin, the Word of God said we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, or as you may have heard me preach in months past, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's not the person of Jesus Christ that advocates for us, but it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that advocates for us. And so, uh, this is the truth that is lost in so many evangelical fundamentalist churches. When they try to apply a heaven or hell to everything, you know, every little misstep, every little mistake, you get People go to church every Sunday. The preacher gets up, preaches them into a state of lunacy. They run down to the altar weeping and snotting all over the altar because they're convinced that they got mad at somebody in customer. They, you know, the, used the ugly hand sign or something in traffic the other day. Or, you know, they did this or they said that or what have you. And all of a sudden, they're convinced that if the Lord came, they'd have missed it because of that one act. Boy, I'm telling you, what a perverted, disgusting view of grace you have to hold to believe that. You have no idea how much that kind of a viewpoint is offensive to God. The Word of God said, for without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please Him. For they that come to God, two things, must first believe that He is. So first of all, you have to believe God exists, period, number one. Number two, that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, that's not the message preached in a lot of churches that he's, are they up there telling you, God is a rewarder, hallelujah. If you'll search for him, if you'll seek him, if you'll live for him, if you'll try to walk in relationship with him, boy, he'll, he'll draw nigh unto you. The word of God said, draw nigh unto God. He'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. God is a rewarder. Now, I haven't heard very many preachers to get up and preach that God is a rewarder, but I sure as murder have heard thousands of preachers get up and preach that he's a judge, a condemner, a criticizer, a destroyer. Am I telling the truth? So when you get the concept of grace down, when you really understand the root of grace, it is unearned favor. It is not only unearned, it is undeserved. Not only did you do nothing to earn it, but really 
if anybody looks at the issue uh, from a from a place of neutrality, they're going to say, you didn't deserve that. God gave you that, but you sure enough didn't deserve that. But your faith, the Apostle Paul said, just like Abraham's faith, is accounted unto you for righteousness. Okay? And this is true, my friend, for the LGBT believer as much as it's true for anybody. He continues in Romans 7. He said, if, I then, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, <clears throat> but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul continues, verse 18, Romans 7, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. He said, I have the will, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. You know, I got I got to stop for a minute and, and talk about this for a second. How many Christians? It's not always about not doing the bad things. Sometimes it's about yes, doing the good things. How many Christians? Tommy and I have talked about this many times over the years. He's new to some of this compared to me, so you know he he comes from a very different perspective. And I've talked about this. Anybody who's followed our church for any time, you've heard me talk about this before. Every day, opportunities are presented to us to do good, to do something that is um, can be an encouragement, a blessing, a help to somebody. Isn't it funny how many Christians can see the opportunity they see. Okay, my co-worker's spouse died and they're having the viewing tonight. Well, but you know, I, I, I didn't really work that close with her or anything, so you know. What are you talking about? Somebody's hurting that's in your world I don't care if they're, if they're attached to you at the hip or if they work two departments over. You know them. You speak to them. You interact with them. You work with them. Can you not think for a minute about how encouraged and how comforted they might be if you take the time and make the effort to go and sign the guest book and give them a hug at their spouse's wake or at their funeral, go to the funeral. Do you know what I'm saying? A lot of Christians, they see. Paul said, Paul said, I see. I'm trying to see how he worded it here again. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. So in other words, yeah, I see it. I see the good thing I could do. I see the compassionate act. I see the uh, testimony I could I could uh, create by doing something nice for this person. You can send flowers if if you can't go to the wake or whatever. Send flowers, you know. Uh, there's any number of things you might be able to do, or at least you can maybe write them a card and give them a card, you know. But anyway, but how many Christians will see these things, but they can't find their way clear to doing it? That's, that's one aspect, folks, of living for the Lord that really comes, to be honest with you, it comes with maturity 
It comes with spiritual growth. I'm not standing here claiming, you know, I'm the most mature and, uh, and most spiritual person on the planet. But I'm going to tell you something. You, I don't care who you ask. Anybody that knows me will tell you. If I see an opportunity to do something for somebody that it might be a blessing to them, might be an encouragement to them, might be a help to them, and it is helping me to be a testimony to them. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to find a way to do it. I'm not going to sit there and excuse myself and, and find every way in the world to get around it. No, because as a believer, it's not enough to not do bad. We're supposed to let your light so shine before men. That they may see your what? Good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. I love to go to a funeral. I don't, I don't like to go to funerals. But I like when I do go to a funeral. I love when I'm sitting there and I didn't know the person maybe. And I hear people talking about how giving they were. And how loving they were. And how much they sacrificed for others and how much they did for others. Do you know what I'm saying? And I love to hear a testimony like that because that, that tells you something about that person. That tells you that where they saw opportunities to do good, they did it. And this is the conflict that Paul is talking about here in Romans 7. He said, you know, I see the opportunity to do good, he said, but my problem is finding the will to get it done, to do the good thing. He said, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So are you, are you seeing the contradiction here? You see? So you have opportunity to, good, to do good, specifically to do good. Not to avoid doing bad. No, 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 no. To do specifically something good. He said, but I don't do it. And then the evil, the things that I shouldn't do, boy, howdy, I don't have any problem in the world doing those things. Verse 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. If I do the things that I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This is the second time in this passage Paul has made that exact same statement. He said, when I do the wrong thing, I'm not doing it. People say, oh, that preacher, he's a heretic. He's saying that Christians don't sin in the eyes of God, bless God. They do these things, and bless God, they're acting like God don't see that they've done these things. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Paul's explaining it right here. He said, if I do that, I would not. If I do the things I don't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So it's not counted against me, as it were, so much as it's recognized that it is the sin that dwells in me. Paul said, verse 21, I find then a law or an immutable fact, something that is absolute, a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight, listen, in the law of God after the inward man. Remember what I just preached on last Sunday? 
talking about the washing of water by the word. It is an inward experience. It is something that occurs on the inside. It is not something that occurs on the outside. So in other words, just because things on the outside don't look like they changed much doesn't mean that God had not done a mighty work on the inside, okay? He said, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, or in my body, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, you're a heretic preacher if you say as long as we're breathing God's free air, we're in sin, and we're under the influence of sin. Read it, idiot. Gee, God have mercy on my soul. How stupid can people be? Really? How stupid can you be? But I grew up in fundamentalism. I know how every passage that doesn't say what they want to say, they have a way of twisting it, perverting it, polluting it, turning it upside down, inside out, until they make you believe it says completely the opposite of everything it says. Yet Paul makes it abundantly clear. He said, listen, this body is my trouble. Long as I'm in this body, I've got issues. I'm under the influence of sin. Sin works in my members. It works in my body. He said, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Then Paul said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Well, Brother Paul, you just got excommunicated from the UPC, honey. You just got knocked out of the assemblies of God. Church of God don't want nothing to do with you because you're a heretic. How dare you imply that the only place you can victoriously live for God is in your head? How dare you? suggest such a thing. Paul, how dare you say that you serve the law of sin in your flesh? How dare you say that, Paul? If sin, according to the Bible, is defined as the transgression of the law, in 1 John 3 and 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And for one to be guilty of one transgression of the law, it is the same as being guilty of transgressing all the law, which is what James said in James chapter 2 and verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So if these two truths exist, one, sin is the transgression of the law. Secondly, to transgress one point of the law is to become guilty of the entire thing. Then... What is the logical conclusion? If those two truths stand side by side, then the sad reality is we cannot ever fully satisfy the law in total, regardless of who we are or how holy we may perceive ourselves. 
this is why the Word of God clearly states that all our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags. Our best efforts don't even begin to amount to the least possible effort in the eyes of God. Read Isaiah 64 verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Many Christians have deceived themselves into believing that they are somehow perfect. They've allowed themselves to believe that their heterosexuality alone puts them in a better standing before the Lord than their gay or lesbian neighbor. Just the fact they're heterosexual puts them ahead of the gay guy next door to them. This is absolute deception. No one stands before God perfect before or after conversion. No one is capable of earning salvation before or after conversion. No one is fully able to live above the influence of sin. It is not possible. But what faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ does for believing humanity is this. It allows us to stand perfect and holy before God today in anticipation of the day when we shall do so in reality. That day will come after our very nature has been changed and we appear before the Lord recreated in His likeness according to man's original design. I've told Tommy if, 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 <laughs> If, we can, if they can afford to put this on my tombstone, I, and I kid you not, I, I would give anything in the world to have this Bible passage on my tombstone because I love this passage. This is by far my favorite Bible verse in the entire Word of God. In Psalm 17, 15, David writes, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Hallelujah. David got it. He was under the law and David got it. He wasn't even under grace and David got it. He said, oh, I'm going to be happy one day. One day I'm going to be a happy camper. And that day is going to be the day I awake in thy likeness. He said, that'll be the day that I finally have achieved satisfaction in life. That'll be the day I finally will be happy with myself when I awake in thy likeness. 1 John 3 and 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Thankfully, while we do not yet appear as we one day shall appear, our loving Heavenly Father looks upon us as though we did. He sees in us that which He Himself has promised to make us. Because His Word cannot possibly fail, and He has promised us, if we will walk in faith and obedience to His plan of salvation, 
that we shall one day be made to look just like him. Hallelujah. And today, because of our faith, he already sees us in that light. <laughs> Woo! Glory! Woo, I want to shout a little. Hallelujah. Woo! Woo! He already sees us in that light where God said he calls oh glory he calls those things which be not as though they were oh he called Abraham Abram he called Abram Abraham the father of many nations before Abraham was even had a kid hallelujah why because his promises are that sure. Woo, hallelujah. Glory, the promises that he cut up. Woo, glory, the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. They are as certain and as solid as anything ever will be. How can I be certain of heaven? Woo, glory. How can I be sure that I'm heaven bound as imperfect and ungodly and unholy as I am? Easy, because God's word cannot fail. And the only thing that can fail, listen to me, is my faith. And the enemy will do everything in his power to convince you to question your faith in the promises and the absolutes of God's word. So when the enemy comes against you for every little thing you do and for, for being LGBT believer, for being who you are, for you divorced believer, for being divorced, for you divorced or a married believer, for being divorced or a married, whatever your situation is, whatever circumstances in your life, when the enemy comes against you, what he's trying to do is get you to believe his lie that your failing and your slipping and your weakness is bigger than God's grace. But if you don't buy into that and you continue to walk in the faith, what he has promised, he is also able to perform. Hallelujah. He calls those things which be not as though they were. That's why we sing today, Oh, I'm redeemed by love divine. Oh, glory, glory, Christ is mine, oh, my, all to him I now resign. I have been, I have been redeemed. No, you haven't. No, you have you have been redeemed. Redemption is what's going to occur at the rapture. Apostle Paul said the redemption of our mortal body. He said, no, we're going to be redeemed when Jesus comes. Till the Lord comes, you're not redeemed. No, you're you got the coupon, but you haven't redeemed it yet. God has given you the down payment the earnest of your salvation, which is the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Word of God teaches that the gift of the Holy Ghost is the earnest, it is the down payment on our redemption, on our salvation. So you got the coupon, but it hadn't been redeemed yet. You follow me? But we still sing, I'm redeemed. Why do we do that? Because it is a statement of faith. We are declaring by faith today what we believe in our heart is the reality for tomorrow. But we don't speak of it as though it won't come until tomorrow. We speak of it as though we have it today. Why? 
because God calls those things which be not as though they were. So much of what we read in the Word of God, much of what we hear preached, much of what we sing about in the church, in the grand old songs of Zion. Honey, the, that's all worth, every word we're singing is the declaration of faith. That's why we Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking, Jesus name baptized. People shout and dance in the aisles and get happy. Because honey, when I say I'm redeemed, glory to God, I believe it right down to the core of my soul. It's not something I believe up here, it's something I believe inside me. And my spirit gets happy when I start talking about some of these things. And yeah, I might shout a while, I might dance, I might talk in tongues, I might run the aisles, might jump up and down, might get happy. Because this isn't a religion. This is a reality. This walking with God in the power of the Holy Ghost becomes such a real thing to us. Get a church full of Holy Ghost people together and we start singing some of them folks, some of them old songs. Woo, we're going to get happy all over the place. Like my aunt said years ago, one of my father's sisters, they didn't grow up in church. My father's parents weren't at all interested in church. They had 12 children. They didn't raise their kids in church. When my mother and dad met, my mother and grandmother used to bring some of my father's siblings to church with them. They used to go to Brother Tatlock's church. Marvelous Jesus name, Pentecostal church in Walcott, Connecticut. And then them folks that shout the rafters down, they dance in the aisles and they worship God with such fervor and such sincerity and such joy overflowing. And my Aunt Susan told me years later, years later, she married a man who had a daughter from a previous marriage and his daughter was Pentecostal. She was Jesus' name as a matter of fact. And my aunt said, we go to church. She said, we don't go to church every Sunday. She said, we go every Christmas and every Easter we go to his daughter's church. She said, and it's a Pentecostal Jesus name church. She said, Chuck, I wouldn't go to any other kind of church. She said, you couldn't get me to go to any other kind of church. She said, the way that you folks worship, the way they dance and shout and celebrate their faith. She said, my God, you know they believe every word they're saying. She said, they, they no question in my mind that those people believe what they sing about. They no question in my mind that they believe what the preacher's preaching. She said, because their, their worship is just so unreserved and so passionate and so energetic and so full of joy. And this is a girl who never was exposed to church until, you know, she was a teenager. Trying to finish this up tonight, I had two avenues I said I was going to try to go down tonight. Yeah, right. One of them. We'll get one of them done tonight, okay? Has this been good, folks? I hope, I hope this has been good. I hope you get All I know is I'm preaching myself happy, so if this isn't doing something for you, I hate to tell you, I don't know what what I can do. Okay, because of our faith, God already sees us in the light of His promise to us. And not in the context of the sinful, failing, frail human creatures that we are. I'll tell you, LGBT believer, LGBT person, I know the struggle of going back and forth, trying to satisfy family in the church. I've been down that road when one tries so hard not to be gay, even going so far as to marry a woman. 
But as I try to tell LGBT believers all the time, if you think you're becoming straight is suddenly going to thrust you into the realms of perfection, acceptance, and approval within the Christian world, <laughs> you are so wrong. Truth is, many LGBT people try so hard to do this in an effort to win the church of their family's approval, only to find in the end that the church still is not satisfied with them. The preacher is still preaching their unworthiness. The church is still inventing new rules, new regulations, new standards that they must yet arise to meet. So in the end, they finally realize that their self-loathing and inability to understand and accept God's grace for them as an LGBT believer is only a minuscule part of the overall problem. That problem being a failure on the part of God's church to fully and truthfully understand and apply the truths of love and grace. Many, the LGBT community especially, will then become so discouraged and despondent after they've, they've gone out of their way to try to be something they're not, and the church still is preaching them in hell, they wind up getting so despondent that they'll simply stop trying to even serve God. Stop trying to be a Christian. Give up on the faith. And the sad part of this story is that was not at all necessary. Because they were going down the wrong road to start with. Instead of trusting God, instead of believing the Word of God, instead of putting your confidence in God's grace and in the promises of His Word, you allowed yourself to be bamboozled by a bunch of lying false prophets. Jesus said false prophets said on the outside they look like you do, but on the inside they're ravening wolves. In other words, they're, they're, their only purpose is to destroy. I'll tell you, in closing tonight, there is not a heterosexual Christian on this planet who doesn't recognize that they have sin and issues in their own lives which they cannot change, no matter how hard they try. And these same Christians will come to the place where they reconcile their faith with their humanity. In other words, they come to accept that this is never going to change. I can't change this. So if I'm going to be saved, I just have to lean on God. I just have to trust God's grace. And they learn to accept the grace of God for themselves. But here's the sad part. They don't want to extend the same courtesy to the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender believer. For one thing, looking at the issue of homosexuality as this huge sin and horrendous transgression helps to reduce the size and scope of their own sin, at least in their own feeble eyes. The worse they allow LGBT people to appear in their eyes, the better they appear in their own sight, even with their faults, failures, weaknesses, and sins. You know, you got Jimmy Swagger who can preach against the LGBT people all day and all night. Forget the fact that he has a penchant for hiring hookers. You see what I'm saying? You know, the worse I make them look, then the smaller my transgression appears in my eyes, not in God's eyes. Because to transgress one matter of the law is to transgress all of them. So that there's absolutely no, there is no argument to be made according to the word of God. I don't care what some jackass 
in Washington says, some idiot Republican, yeah, I said it. I don't care what they say. There is no argument in the Word of God to be made for any sin, no matter how small you might define it, lying, cheating, being defined as a lesser or greater sin than another. So trying to segregate homosexuality as some great enormous sin, honey, the Word of God blows that whole idea right out of the water. That, that whole notion is non-existent in Scripture. Doesn't matter what portion of the law you transgress. To transgress one point, you have broken all the law. It is an all-or-nothing proposition. This is why I started talking earlier, and I got off track, about that, that uh, rabbi, that Jewish rabbi who's very famous. And, so, and he told Pat Roberts, he said, we don't bar anybody from the synagogue. We don't, we don't close the doors to the synagogue to any Jew that wants to observe and worship God. He said, how can we? So we know that Torah is broken by every one of us. And we know that there's no such thing in the Torah as a big sin or a little sin. There's not one sin that is greater than another. And I, I, I'm not going back to where I've been before because we're out of time. I went down a list of all the items in the way, every one of them in the Word of God that is identified as an abomination. By the time you went through that whole list, literally, there was nothing left. The bottom line is, anything that is called sin, whether it be eating shellfish, or sowing dissent among brethren, or lying, or cheating somebody, whatever, whether it be a ritual law, whether it be a so-called sexual law or a moral law, it doesn't matter to transgress any one of those. You become a transgressor of the law in its entirety. And when you understand that, all of a sudden there's room in God's church for everybody. All of a sudden there is no room, like Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. All of a sudden you understand all the things the Lord taught. If you understood the law, Mr. Speaker of the House, like you claim you do, an ignorant thing, if you understood the law at all, then you'd understand that. We're all sinners in need of grace. And there is no room for anybody to sit in judgment of another. If somebody has a mind to come into the house of God and worship God, and they're willing to make an attempt to live for God and serve Him, then we have no business closing the door of the church and telling them they're not welcome. The gay lesbian population has simply become a tool whereby some in the church are able to reduce their own failings and elevate themselves by putting the other down. Bottom line, my friend, if you're LGBT today, I hope tonight you've, you've caught a little glimpse into the reality of grace. Hallelujah. Isn't it a wonderful thing? I'm telling you, when you <laughs> when you understand this thing, the way you're supposed to understand it, oh, honey, I'm telling you what, you can't help but want to go to church and shout a while. You can't help but want to worship the Lord with enthusiasm and passion and, and energy because you realize just how wonderful and how marvelous this great gospel really is. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm out of time. Whew. My Lord, have mercy. I'm going to call this session tonight Grace and the LGBT Believer. We'll be sharing this video later. I hope tonight that our broadcast has gone out without any interruptions 
And without any issues last week, I apologize. Uh, we had a new internet provider come in and wire new service. The guy came in on Tuesday, and I thought everything was going to be installed Tuesday. So I canceled our old provider because we were having trouble with them for the same day, you know, that we were going to transition to the new provider. Well, the guy, I thought he was outside working on, you know, putting our service in. And after a few hours, they got a text saying that he had left. And they said, you need to make another appointment to have another guy come out and finish because he couldn't finish. And I didn't even know he left. Had no way he didn't come in and tell me he was leaving or nothing. So, so last uh, Wednesday night, we wound up without internet, and Tommy and I tried to improvise, and unfortunately it wound up failing and it didn't work, you know. And so anyway, but I hope with our new service and everything, I hope y'all have been able to see this entire Bible study. I hope it has been a blessing to you. We would greatly appreciate your comments and your feedback. I've gotten some beautiful, um, encouraging words from some folks in the last... Um, a few days, last Sunday's service, uh, I got some really, really nice comments. A matter of fact, last Wednesday night's Bible study, once I got the video up, uh, one man in particular wrote me a beautiful comment about how much uh, our study has been eye-opening and, and uh, helpful to him. And uh, we're grateful for that. That encourages me so much and helps me to find the energy to keep on keeping on. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Master, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. But more than this, we thank you for the plan of salvation, for the way of truth. We thank you, Lord, for the efforts to which you have gone in order to provide lost humanity with the means to make heaven their home, to live in your presence for eternity, Master, to reign with you as kings and priests. We ask God tonight that this study, this discussion, this venture into the Word of God today will bear fruit in our lives, helping God to inspire faith in our soul, faith to believe you for the promises of your word, to trust what you have said and not care about what the Southern Baptist Convention says or the Assemblies of God says or the Church of God or any other denomination or organization. They are not our go-between. They are not our means for attaining salvation, you are. And the promises of God are yea and amen through Christ Jesus our Lord. Master, we love you. What a wonderful God we serve. We thank you for this time together. Help us, Lord, to meditate upon that which we've heard. And Master, let it become cemented into our very spirit. Help it, Lord, to uh, just spring forth and bring life into our spirit today where there has been death and destruction because of fear and unbelief and wrong teaching. Oh, restore unto us the joy of thy salvation. Master, we love you. We thank you. Be with us, O oh God, in this dangerous world. Keep us, everyone, in your care. Until the next appointed time, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We have a new program. I'll tell you real fast about it. If you're homeless or if you're just struggling financially, going through a difficult time, anyone that comes to our church on Sunday for our 3 o'clock service, when you come in the door, do not be ashamed, do not be afraid. To say, um, I would like uh, to get a card at the end of the service. Just, just tell us, because we do have to keep a certain amount of records for, uh, you know, we have to uh, try to think of the word I want to use. 
But anyway, you, you have to keep, you know, a certain amount of records for these sorts of things. So we have it all documented. You have to document. Dear Jesus, I couldn't think of the word document. You have to document these sort of things, you know, so that if ever the time came and we had to present to the government, you know, that we were doing um, a charitable work, whatever, you know, uh, all we're going to ask is your name, ask, you know, what city you come from, how old you are, uh, what gender you identify as. We're not going to ask you about your sexual orientation or anything like that. We, we don't care. That doesn't matter to us. Uh, but just, you know, a few simple questions. And uh, if you are a husband and wife, then you'll each receive a $10 card. We're going to try to give you the choice. There are about five or so restaurants near the church, right in the neighborhood of the church. Uh, and they are fast food, and I hate to admit it, but we're, we're small, we're new, we don't have a whole lot of money, folks. Okay? This whole program is an act of faith on our part. Uh, so we're given $10 gift card per person. If you bring three kids with you, mom and dad, you're going to get five gift cards. Okay, So you'll have $50 worth of gift cards to use at the restaurant of your choice. We're actually going to try to give you a choice. Um, I'm, I'm kind of funny about things, you know. Uh, I hate when when they do programs, you know, and it's like you just have to take whatever they give you, you know. We're not wanting to do that to anybody, so we're going to give you the option if you want your gift cards to be from uh, Subway, if you want them to be from McDonald's, if you want them to be from Wendy's, Burger King or um, uh, Arby's is another one. Uh, you'll be able to choose where you want your gift card from. And uh, so long as we have those cards available for you, and we'll try to, then you'll get those, okay? And, uh, and that'll be available to anyone who wants to come. We're new. We do not have folks coming to church as of yet. And to be honest with you, this old preacher has a difficult time preaching to an empty building. Uh, I preach to the camera because we have a large internet audience. But it would be very helpful and it would be a blessing to me to have some people in the seats, okay? So we are sincerely asking you for your help. And we're going to do something for you in return for your helping us, okay? So this is a symbiotic thing. This, you know, this is, we're not trying to force religion on anybody. Anybody who knows my ministry, anybody who knows my church, I won't preach at you. <laughs> I won't preach. But we, we do not by any means use emotional manipulation. We do not use a lot of the techniques you see common in a lot of fundamentalist and evangelical churches. Uh, we don't play those games, okay? And all you have to do is visit once and you'll see that we don't do that to anybody, okay? And uh, all we need you to do is come be part of our uh, studio audience, I guess you could say. And that'll be a help to us and we will bless you in return <clears throat> with a gift card, okay? Our address is the uh, Century Office Center at 3322 Memorial Parkway Southwest, Suite Number 537. It's the center building of the three side-by-side -side buildings. We're in the center building at the far back end. And uh, you'll see us up on the second floor, 3322 uh, Memorial Parkway Southwest, Suite 537. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. And I hope you'll come be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock p.m. for a celebration of life in Christ. I also hope our friends will come be with us again next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our midweek Bible study as we continue our look into LGBT-affirming theology. Until we see you again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.